Following on our agenda, let me first introduce uh, LIB for FNSSA project. This is a long-term EU-AU research and innovation partnership on food security and sustainable agriculture. It's a coordination and support action under the framework of H2020. The main objective of this project is to provide a tool for European and African institutions to engage in a sustainable partnership platform for research and innovation on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. Um, under the aegis of the high level policy dialogue, which is the HLPD and its bureau, building upon former EU funded projects such as RINIA, CASNET Plus, uh, Pro Intense Africa, and linking with the ongoing ERANAT Co Fund LEAP Agri, LEAP for FNSSA aims to achieve its main objective through um, increasing synergies and coherence between. Um, actors, research and innovation projects, initiatives and programs through the development of institutional alliances and clusters of projects. Also through enhanced learning environment and the large knowledge base, including monitoring and evaluation activities and established communication and links between different initiatives in order to improve European African cooperation in science, technology and innovation, STI. Um, meanwhile, a well-established long-term sustainable partnership and co-funding mechanism. LIB for mm. FNSSA impact will enable and catalyze the transformation of the existing uh, AU EU FNSSA partnership into a bicontinental platform for collaboration <clears throat> organized along a knowledge management and communication framework. This project will last for four years which uh, started no November 2018, and it will end on October 2022. The main actions of the project is to support the Bureau of the EU, EU HLPD in implementing the FNSSA roadmap, creating strategic alliances of actors committed to align their RNI activities to the FNSSA roadmap, strengthening the knowledge base to increase the efficiency of the AU EU research and innovation partnership on FNSSA. And it also facilitates within the relevant FNSSA research and innovation networks. Uh, if we look to the expected impacts, uh, they are, number one, a substantial co contribution to the implementation of the AU EU HLPD roadmap on FNSSA by organizing and offering relevant and efficient support to the AU EU HLPD Bureau. A structured, which is number two, a structured long term partnership between diverse actors dedicated to the implementation of the HLPD roadmap, including a governance system for the platform. Number three, coherence, synergy, and optimization of RI projects and programs in the FNSSA domain by creating a true cluster of projects innovation in agriculture systems and based on the utilization of R&I outputs. This, is, this was a, a brief or a quick um, 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 introduction about the project itself. Um, as an attempt to raise awareness on topics and initiatives concerning the AU EU research, innovation partnership on food and nutrition, security and sustainable agriculture, um, the project planned a series of webinars throughout the the time frame of the project. The foreseen series of webinars aim at covering the main pillars of the FNSSA sectors, which are policies and institutional aspects, social participation, economic landscapes, and integrative sustainable network, respectively. Webinar one will be entitled Dynamics of the AU EU Approaches for Rural Transformation which we will have today. Webinar two will be empowering the community through inclusiveness and engagement in the food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture sector. Webinar three will be about unlocking the potential of AU um, EU Alliance for Sustainable Investment, Job Creation and Strengthening Economic Networks. And webinar four will be entitled Boosting Synergies Between the Entrepreneurship, Research, Innovation and Industry End Users in the Food and agriculture sector. Um, today we will start with our first webinar entitled Dynamics of the AU-EU Approaches for the Rural Transformation. 
it will tackle the policy making segment of the FNSSA sectors by shedding the light on the recently released report of the task force rural Africa and Africa Europe agenda for rural transformation. This report stresses the importance of good policy as the key to uh, as the key to developing the agro food uh, the agri food sector and rural areas. And here, Europe and Africa can draw on their rich capacities and experience. It also recommends to directly involve farmers, cooperatives, civil society, and the private sector in policy making and in their own futures. Um, I believe um, we, we shall start now with uh, our um, EU expert, Dr. Bruno Losch, who is an elite political economist at CIRAD and director of the Center of Governance Innovation Gov in. Dr. Bruno, how are you? Very well, thank you. I hope okay. on the technical side everything works correctly. Okay. Do you, can you all hear Dr. Bruno? I believe, yes, they all hear us. Excuse me? Yeah. I believe we are, they, they can all hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in your presentation, you will talk to us about um, the changing uh, um, of EU-Africa political relationship, the context for African and European policies and governance for agriculture, and EU's trading relationship with Africa and policy coherence for development. Okay. Okay. We can start. Okay, we can start. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, so. Uh, as you know, I was um, a member of the Task Force for Rural Africa. Yes. yes. Um, so the, the topic of today is the agenda for rural transformation. But uh, you, you asked me to, to introduce more precisely about uh, the changing uh, landscape uh, in the EU-Africa political relationship. So of course, it's, it's quite difficult to comment about the the effectiveness uh, of a changing political re relationship between the, the two continents, because uh, if announcements have, have been made over the, the last two, three years, uh, if there is a new Africa, Europe, Ireland for sustainable development and jobs, which was launched in September last year uh, during the State of the Union uh, a speech of the President Juncker. Even if we have the, the report of the Task Force Rural Africa, <clears throat> which was released in, in March this year, I need here to remind that uh, the task force was, the, the, the implementation of the, of the task force was decided in January 18, uh, and the, the work of the task force started in May last year, which means that it was more or less six months before the launch of the new Africa-Europe Alliance. It's good to have this in mind mm -hmm. uh, in terms of connections of the different topics. So we, 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 have, we have got the, 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 the Alliance, we have got the, the, the report of the Task Force for Rural Africa. Uh, we have got more recently the third African Union, European Union, Agricultural Ministerial Conference in Rome, which was about promoting a sustainable regional agricultural value chains. And so uh, the, the effectiveness of the, 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 this changing political relationship will of course depend on, on the coherence, on actions and implementation. Uh, so, at that stage, uh, from what has been done and what has been decided, uh, there is a plan to have a, a high-level task force, uh, a high-level body, to try to avoid too many task forces, uh, about implementing what, what, what has been decided in terms of a roadmap. We have also an action agenda uh, which comes out of the Rome uh, Ministerial Declaration with the uh, deliverables which, which, uh, which exist. But uh, more possibly importantly, in my view, uh, there is clearly a need uh, for policy coherence for development, for PCD, 
policy coherence for development in agriculture, trade, environment, and migration policies. Uh, uh, on this specific issue, the task force for rural Africa was very clear that it was important to have a, a multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, about this policy coherence uh, and to uh, use and to refer and to scale up to the existing guidelines on uh, responsible uh, business conduct on responsible investments but also to tackle the, the several issues which are related to food imports uh, uh, from the EU in Africa and also about uh, the conditions of FDI, of foreign direct investments, and particularly FDI for, from Europe. Uh, I think it's, it's something which is quite critical, uh, on, on which will depend uh, the quality of the partnership between Africa and Europe. And uh, from my point of view, uh, being a former member of the Task Force for Africa, it seems to me that it's somewhat too much low key in the existing process. But well, we will see, we, will, we are only at the, the first stages of uh, the implementation of this new relation. Uh, of course, as, as you know well, we will have a new European Commission uh, in uh, one month from now. So uh, well, I think that uh, um, the different uh, uh, steps and the process we, we start uh, uh, from the beginning of next year. So now, uh, uh, if I go back to uh, the topic of this session, which, which is about the agenda for rural transformation, uh, I think what, what is important to, to have in mind is that uh, um, uh, in, uh, in terms of what, 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 could be, what could be new in terms of this partnership between the two continents, is the fact that uh, uh, there is a, a strong recognition of the fact that the partnership between the two continents is a major investment uh, uh, in, in the future. Uh, it was, I think, something which was said by President Juncker in Abidjan, in the Abidjan summit in 2017, uh, because the forces at play uh, in terms of inequalities, in terms of climate change, in terms of population growth, will be completely decisive of our common futures, future. And so the, the answers to these challenges uh, of uh, African structural transformation will be uh, a, a critical driving force in the partnership. Uh, in that process, the, the rural urban restructuring will be central. And uh, uh, in, the, in the foreword of the uh, task Force Rural Africa report, uh, there is a strength which is uh, made on the fact that the solutions to agriculture in Africa will be found beyond agriculture through territorial approach to rural development in the widest sense. Uh, and I cite, no more silos. And I think that the uh, the sense that articulated strategies are important and that siloed sectoral policies are not anymore an option is something which, ha which guided the work of the, the Task Force Rural Africa. Just to remind that it's the Task Force Rural Africa, it's not the Task Force Agriculture in Africa. So this rural dimension, this, this rural perspective is important. So, uh, as a way the, the task force engaged uh, uh, in this work was clearly to, to, to start from, uh, I would say, the, the most critical challenges. And one of the most critical challenges is the one of um, African employment, uh, because it illustrates the importance of the processes underway in Africa. We, 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 we need to keep in mind the numbers. Uh, the, the population in Africa uh, by 2050 will increase by 1.2 billion people. Uh, it translates in an increase of the active population of 800 million, 
which will be between 60, 65% of the global increase of the active population. Uh, it means that every year today in Africa, the yearly cohort of youth entering the working age is about 25 million every year, and it will be more than 30 million in 2030. So in the next 10 years, if we, if we do the addition of the, this yearly cohort uh, entering the working age, it means that we will have 380 million youth in Sub-Saharan Africa, I take the only the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, who will look for a job or who will look for uh, uh, an income generating activity. So it, 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 it is really a, a critical, uh, critical, critical data, critical numbers that we need to keep in mind. So facing this very specific situation, the other very important um, aspect, which is raised by the, the Task Force World Africa report, is about the, the, the strong diversity of the African continent. Uh, I think we, we say in the report that we, we, we could consider that first there, there are three Africas. There is the uh, North Africa, the region. There is South Africa, the country, with a such specific history. And there is the Middle Africa, which is the Sub-Saharan Africa minus South Africa. And this, this uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is also very diverse. Diversity in terms of paces of change, in terms of demographic transition, uh, evolution of the fertility rates, uh, diversity in terms of economic transition and the level of diversification of the Sub-Saharan African economies. A uh, strong diversity also in terms of pace, rhythm of urbanization, and also the fact that in many places in Africa, there are emerging new regions and new territories. <clears throat> but one common feature with a couple of, of exceptions of couple of, particularly in North Africa, and South Africa, and a couple of countries in the Gulf of Guinea, which are oil exporting countries, it's the importance, the role of agriculture in all these processes. Not necessarily in terms of GDP, but in terms of role of agriculture in employment. Because uh, even if the average here is not the most adequate, but just to give an idea, uh, with the range, with the gradient of the difference between countries, but but about 60-65% of the active population in Sub-Saharan Africa is engaged in agriculture. In some countries, in the Sahelian region, it can be clearly higher, 75 in some countries. In other region, in other countries, it's of course less. But it's, it, gives a, it gives the importance of agriculture uh, in this specific context of strong restructuring and strong process of change. So it means that in that context of a ongoing demographic transition, uh, economic diversification, continuing urbanization, emergence of new regions which are related to the fact that due to growing densities in some places in Africa, uh, the divide between the rural and urban uh, is fading. And so it's, it has, as a consequence, it, it implies that it's necessary to look differently uh, at what could be the future of these places. And so uh, this is why in the Task Force Africa reports, uh, with this process of uh, funneling from the, the big numbers, the big pictures to specific situations, we, we clearly emphasize the fact that it's very important to have and to adopt a place-based approaches uh, because, because people, uh, they live in places, they don't live in a sector. And so it's very important to, to, to take on board opportunities and constraints which exist uh, in a specific place, in a specific region, uh, in order to discuss options and to discuss alternatives uh, and, and, and clearly to be able to design adequate, adequate strategies based on shared vision 
and dialogue, multi the dialogue, and also dialogue between different levels of governments. And so it's, it's clearly uh, a strong positioning of what has been proposed uh, uh, by, by the task force for rural Africa. And uh, ba based on, on this uh, overall perspective, so four, four main strategies of actions were proposed by, by the report. The first one, of course, related to what I just said was to uh, put the, the territorial development strategy for income and job, job creation as a strong priority. Uh, then to have, a, uh, to take on board the, the importance of the on, ongoing processes related to climate change and so to have a, sustainable land and natural resources management are the a, a key area for action. Then the third, the third key area, strategic area, was about the structural transformation of African agriculture, uh, but take, taking on board the fact that uh, in, in rural Africa, we still have an agriculture which is characterized by the importance of family farming. And the fourth, uh, 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 area for action was, was about the, the importance and the, the strong power engine that uh, agro-food industry can be in Africa today. And so based on the, the huge potential of growing domestic markets, of the growing continental markets, with the perspective also to improve the uh, regional integration and the more facilities in terms of uh, intra-Africa trade. This, this fourth area of action can be clearly a driver supporting the development of, uh, of African agriculture. So uh, in, a, in a couple of, uh, of, of words, uh, it's the type of message based on the, what was developed within the task force uh, Rural Africa I wanted to, to highlight and to, to put forward. I don't hear you. Uh, sorry, and uh, thank you, Dr. Bruno. Um, uh, we have a question, but um, we, we will raise the questions um, at a later stage during our webinar. Now uh, we want to welcome Dr. Um, Irene Frampong. Uh, hello, Dr. Irene. Uh, Dr. Dr. Um, um, Dr. Irene. Um, could you, um, she, uh, Dr. Ayun is an, our AU expert director of capacity strengthening at Forum for Agriculture Research in Africa, or FARA. Um, you will be talking to us today about the mainstreaming policies into actions and uh, programs, uh, strategic challenges facing African rural transformation, gaps in the development and implementation of FNSSA policies, and a brief on the actions of the agri-food and rural agenda. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to be part of this webinar. Um, I, I, I realized that you were reading my, my, my past. <laughs> As I'm currently the, the Director for Research and Innovation instead of Capacity Strengthening. Okay, this was yeah. in your uh, signature. Yeah. We took it from the signature, I believe. Okay, sorry yeah. for any... Oh, Inconvenience. Okay, we're sorry. Anyway, thank you, thank you, <laughs> you're, Dr. You're that was um, uh, very, very exciting to listen to you talking about the uh, task force rural Africa. I mean, they, I've had uh, another presentation in an earlier meeting uh, provided by um, one of the members, actually the chair, and I've been, I've been. Um, looking at this and, and believing that this, this report or the proposal by Task Force Rural Africa is something that needs to be taken serious. I have, um, in my, my brief um, presentation, I will touch on, as it says, strategic challenges, um, then look at some gaps that uh, I think we still have in the development uh, and implementation of FNSSA, and then maybe 
make a couple of uh, comments um, by way of actions that I feel uh, we should be looking at. So I'm not going to also belabor the points you have made, Dr. Bruno, about the general uh, strategic challenges facing um, the continent, but it may be important to also reiterate that um, and I think you also mentioned that the, the fact that agriculture itself um, um, depends on other sectors to find its solutions, um, it means that we have to look broader beyond agriculture. Um, and that we need to successfully deploy uh, the, the, the knowledge and innovation systems that will drive the agricultural sector. Um, but then we will find it from other, other aspects or other areas. Um, issues around policies, institutions, and investments that are the controllable element of the entire um, knowledge and innovation um, system that, in a way, it predicates um, research and innovation partnership that we are talking about between Africa and Europe. And it's, it's of the essence uh, to probably uh, mention. Also to mention what you've already indicated, those mega trends that Africa and Europe need to pay attention to, particularly in Africa, where we're grappling with higher population growth, um, issues of climate change, urbanization, you know, in, in the last decade, it's been unprecedented. Um, Incomes linked to change in diets, all these things that you nicely put together in, in the report, um, actually also emphasizes uh, the need for us to produce more efficiently um, on less resources. Also reduce waste and losses and produce more nutritious uh, uh, and safe foods. So these elements actually then asks the question or calls for increased um, and more effective application and implementation of all these nice ideas that we have in, 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 the, in the report. The other strategic challenging area is the call for the shift from production or agriculture production to the agri-food subsystems particularly from Africa's standpoint, we, we, we have um, a system that's not that sophisticated, even though we have varied or diverse uh, subsystems or production systems. But if you look at the, the shift, the transformation that Africa needs to make, when you look at um, the, the agri-food system, that is huge because Africa has over 62% of this system around just the farming. Whereas if you compare it globally, um, the, the, the agri-food system has a number of subsystems uh, that's well developed uh, from farming. Farming is only 22% globally. Africa is 62% compared to 23% input supply, logistics, retail processing. Africa has a very small base um, around all those things. So from Africa's standpoint, this partnership on research and innovation is critical uh, to the transformation that we seek. And that's why I think our partnership with Europe is, is unique because some of the aspects that you pointed out in the report highlight some common or commonalities that when we work together uh, will be important uh, for the continent. Again, I ask the question that there are quite a number of efforts have already been put in place and we continue to make those efforts. Um, if you look at it, the global continental uh, frameworks, but are they effective in engineering the change we seek? You know, if you start from sustainable development goals, how it links to Africa, we, we have frameworks and, and I think you mentioned that as well as the FNSSA roadmap articulates clearly how Agenda 2063 uh, is, is what Africa is, is put together 
to show what, what we, we anticipate uh, should happen uh, for the Africa we want. And below that, we have also a number of, of frameworks, including our, our good uh, CADAP um, framework itself, that now uh, we seek to track under the Malabo uh, commitments. Of course, under Agenda 2063, we have CISA, we have PIDA, we have Feed Africa, and we have the science agenda that more recently also informed the AU EU FNSSA roadmap. So the question I ask is, we have all these things, how do we then make them effective? And now we have uh, Task Force Rural Africa. Uh, that's actually, really, I think, if you read that report, I mean, knowing all these frameworks, it gives me comfort that it tries to pull the strings and, and, uh, together uh, and make some very serious and practical um, suggestions. But there's, there's still the question is, how do we ensure that all these frameworks and policies, uh, be it documents or actions, how do we ensure that it goes downstream to tackle the issues that you identified you know, at the rural and local level? And perhaps, yes, the, the territorial uh, approach is um, something that we can, we can uh, hang on to. But there are other, other, other things that I think we need to also pay attention. If I take the example of CADAP, last year when CADAP was uh, presented um, using the Biennial Review Report on the Malabo commitment, it was reported that um, out of those seven commitments, 20 member states in Africa were on track and 27 were not. And this for me speaks a lot because before we got to these numbers, if you drill down, you will see the number of indicators, over 47 of them that were tracked to give us this kind of the sense of what Africa is doing under Canada. This year, we are yet to report, but the, the earlier report that is going to the uh, Specialized Technical Committee already indicates that the numbers have dropped tremendously from a number of 20 member states being on track to about four. Now, so the question is, how do we, you know, ensure that all these plans, frameworks, policies, and, and agendas actually link up to what the rural communities are doing that make up the, the countries? And well, one may talk about maybe the numbers may not be right or getting the numbers is, is difficult, but at least it gives us an understanding of, of the enormity of the problem in the, and, and the, the, the disparity between the, the policies and the implementation, uh, which is what you know, I, I want to talk about. Um, I have this year, for instance, there are four countries, including Rwanda, uh, Morocco, Mali, and Ghana. Those are the four countries that are pointed out as successful. If you now drill down and take Rwanda, for instance, and Rwanda has consistently been cited as a country that is doing very well uh, when it comes to um, agriculture, fastest growing within the last decade or so. But they, put, they attribute the success to high level of political commitment, increased application of inputs and land management practices, market and value chain development. And if you go down further, you see that some of the programs and projects in, in Rwanda are really rural uh, level uh, programs that if we are careful to see how it ratchets up to the national agenda, um, that, that could, um, we could learn the leaf uh, from, from the Rwanda example. So what does this mean, citing this example? Meaning basically that the processes that we undertake to come up with national, regional, continental, and even global level policies are not the same processes when we are going backwards to ensure that these policies are implemented. If we can make a, a proper alignment of the two forward and backward processes, maybe we will find um, implementation 
guidelines in there. In a sense that um, if you take um, CADAP again, under which the science agenda was developed, the implementation of such programs requires that the countries themselves or the local uh, people are in multiple or multi-stakeholder platforms that will be able to give us an idea of what needs doing in order to achieve uh, our targets or our policies. But these platforms at the local level need facilitation, continuous facilitation. It needs um, capacity uh, to ensure that even though you have multiplicity of, of um, partners, these local partners have the voice that can ratchet up to the national level. So oftentimes we are paying too much attention on their participation and less attention on the capacity to ensure that the, their voices actually uh, get, uh, their voices do not get lost, if I can put that way, uh, when we come up to looking at the forward level uh, policy development. So that's one uh, gap that I think we need to look at uh, in terms of the forward and backward processes. Uh, uh, that if we want to get into implementation. We talk about fragmentation. Um, so many um, programs, so many initiatives. We are talking of Africa and Europe now, but I can sit in another platform and talk about Africa and the US, and I can be in another platform and talk about Africa and China, and another one and talk about Africa and uh, Australia. You know, so if you take it from that point, Africa is now torn in different directions and we have so many initiatives that are fragmented, some of them very small, some of them, you know, making the impact, but small impact that need to be scaled. The partnership between Africa and Europe is unique and, and it's quite strong. So how do we, how do we then make this uh, an issue? for Africa-Europe partnership to grapple with this kind of fragmentation. I know that this is one of the key reasons why LEAP for FNSSA is important. Because the idea of LEAP for FNSSA, as the uh, Madam Moderator explained, uh, is how to ensure that we deal with this fragmentation, improve coherence uh, of, of implementation, uh, and, and as it were, get the impact that we are looking for. But still key problems or key uh, gaps uh, remain. Um, investments of the countries themselves, very low. And you rightly pointed out the share partnership between Africa and Europe, it's a huge investment. But how do we get commensurate investment by the countries themselves, the domestic investment, that should support the rural um, sector in terms of when you talk of rural transformation. How do we uh, support rural futures so that rural sector are able to take charge of, of what they, they want to do? How do we ensure that um, we have the infrastructure at the rural level? How do we ensure that you talked about employment? How do we ensure that we have the capacity for the simple artisanry? that is required at the rural sector in order to ensure we can link small scale farmers to mainstream markets. You know, so, so we still have those issues and I, I really uh, hope that the, the proposals that are being put forward under, under the Rural Task, uh, um, task Force Rural Africa uh, is taken seriously and that is also brought on. We also add other experiences from CADAP, from Science Agenda, from other, um, the implementation of other programs uh, to be able to implement uh, the, the, the actions or the recommendations under um, the, the task force rural Africa. Um, so, um, Madam Moderator, um, there, there are quite a lot to say, but I think the essence of this webinar is to point out a few gaps and also identify areas where we need to um, put on the table and be able to sift the big things that need doing um, 
the, the Africa Europe ministerial um, dialogue, for instance, how do we ensure that from one ministerial dialogue to the next, you know, there is some alignment and, you know, we have also coherence there. How do we ensure that there is harmonization of the investments uh, that, that we are getting, particularly in Africa? Huge efforts have been made, no doubt, but we still have a long way uh, to go. We've learned uh, lessons and uh, we have a long way uh, to go. So in conclusion, uh, let me reiterate some of the points I'm trying to make. Territorial development approach, I think it's, it's good. It's a superior um, proposal because it touches the, the downstream, the, the heart of the issue. We need to ensure that local, in that setting, local voices are heard. To be, to be able to do that, we need the capacity in the relevant spaces, in the relevant local spaces to, to make uh, their voices heard and be informed to, to inform the policies. And secondly, that we ensure that the institutions and processes that are put in place to translate global, regional, continental policies into action. That's, that's also a weak link there. There are institutions, but they are weak. I mean, I can cite my own institution, other sub-regional institutions that are there. I know that EC is actually paying attention to that because there's a new program seeking to strengthen that kind of uh, institutions that will do the translation. But we need to pay attention to that uh, uh, process of translating. And that should be involving the, the, the local people. Then the, the other point is once that is strengthened, how do we also ensure that at the rural level, the innovation platforms that we talk about, you know, uh, so eloquently, how do they actually work at the uh, rural level, at the operational level, but also at the strategic level that requires policy support uh, to uh, the, 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 the national or local, or local level. So um, give or take, I think that um, the Leap for FNSSA is, has its role. Um, we seek to refine some of the things we are doing, paying attention, of course, to the, 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 the report of, of um, the task force, uh, Rural Africa, but also paying attention to some of the huge experiences and lessons we have learned in Africa around many of the of the projects. Um, PIPAD, for instance, uh, uh, has given us a lot of examples and a, a lot of lessons that we can learn. So to continuously, and I, I like this webinar idea that Leap for FNSS is doing, continually uh, have a discourse that, that always feeds into what we do uh, in the process of implementing uh, the policies of FNSS. So uh, let me stop here and um, um, open up, um, hand it over to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Irene. Uh, now it's uh, time for uh, questions and answers and we have uh, questions here. Uh, someone is saying, or um, uh, someone called Everisto, uh, how can the silo mentality be resolved at all levels? Starting with the review, and task force processes themselves? This is question number one. Um, are you going to answer now or take all the questions? It's up to you. How do you want to organize the discussion? Mm, okay, maybe we can take the answer for this question. Uh, well, how to, <laughs> how to deal with the silo mentality? Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's clearly a, a major issue because uh, it directly relates uh, to how uh, every organization uh, works. And uh, uh, it's, it's clearly easy to have a routine and uh, practices and to uh, perpetuate a specific type of approaches which are related to your own specialization. But here, when we, when we ask for breaking the silo mentality, it's clearly to 
highlight the fact that uh, the many structural challenges that uh, Africa faces, but uh, we can say the same for everywhere, uh, these challenges are always interconnected, uh, articulated, embedded. And so it's very difficult to uh, avoid uh, adopting a sort of a systemic approach as a way to reconnect the dots between different topics and different issues. So for this, uh, I, I strongly consider, and it was something which was quite discussed and uh, uh, that then we, we put forward uh, in the, the report of Task Force Rural Africa, then um, adopting a, a place-based approach or regional approach or territorial approach, whatever the, the, the the way you want to name it, it's very important because it, it's a good way to articulate different dimensions which are related to the specificities of a place in terms of economic characteristics, uh, situation in terms of natural resources, uh, social, uh, social context, cultural context, etc. And uh, adopting uh, uh, an approach at that level is also a way to get uh, more easily uh, ownership and uh, participation from the local stakeholders because they are more connected to the type of challenges and discussions that you want to, to address. So uh, re-engaging through participation uh, at that level is a good way to highlight, show the interconnections and to, and to escape the silo mentality. Uh, I take the opportunity to, to insist on something that uh, uh, Dr. Renf uh, uh, just, just mentioned. It's uh, the fact that pa participation, well, it's not enough. Uh, you can have participation, but if it's only to tick the box, uh, with regard to uh, what you are committed to in terms of uh, implementing a specific process, it does not help much. You can have uh, around the table, you can have uh, representatives from farmers, but uh, if they don't have, as you said, uh, the effective support and effective capacity building to be effective participants in the process, it can't work and uh, you have no chance to escape the silos which are developed by the specialists. Um, just to add to this question of silo mentality, um, yes. to what um, Dr. Bruno just said, is, is to break it is to adopt a problem-based uh, program instead of a discipline-based program. Because if you look at it, we could start at the rural level or local level trying to identify problems. By the time it becomes a, a project or a program at the national level, it becomes a, a discipline-based project that is being implemented around disciplines. So we may talk about interdisciplinarity and, and the interconnectedness, but we can only get the silo out of the system if we maintain the problem that needs to be addressed and the problem should be at the implementation level you see so oftentimes we lose it we start with a the problem then by the time we fashion out uh, the project or the program be it at national or whatever it becomes uh, about a discipline about a uh, even if you take climate change, climate change may be uh, a, a major issue, but if you come to the local level, it, it manifests in different ways. So how do we tackle the actual problem at the local level that climate change presents as the pro program that we are implementing? You see. Okay, thank you. Um, um, we have also um, another question. Uh, how the task force report has been received in Africa. Uh, I'll, I'll give you all the questions and then you can answer both of you. Um, also, uh, how can BPRF and SSA bridge the cleavage between North Africa and SSA donor funding and institutional collaboration? 
um, another question. Uh, the dimensions proposed to encourage sustainable agriculture if adoptions and rural farmers' perceptions are taken to consideration. And uh, someone is commenting, uh, Dr. Bruno, that um, he or she didn't really get the point of promoting intra-African trade. And these are all we have. We still have around seven minutes. So perhaps, uh, Dr. Irene, I, I let you start about uh, how the task force report was received in Africa. It, to, to, to my knowledge, uh, there was no formal presentation organized so far because it's, well, it, it, it remains something which is quite new. And because we are also in the process of uh, changing European Commission, I don't know, but uh, well, I am based personally in, in South Africa. I, I'm speaking to you from Cape Town. And uh, there was there was no specific debate organized about about the task force report. So possibly at the at the Rex level, the regional economic communities, something occurred, but I am not aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, from my end, well, the task force report, I think, is just at the discussion level, in you know places where uh, implementation of higher level programs cut up. Uh, and the likes are going on. It's not actually trickled down to um, national level or even trickled into um, CADAP tracking report. I mean, for now, CADAP is like high on the agenda, tracking, doing the binary review, tracking all, all, lots, all sorts of indicators. The Africa um, uh, report, the task force report is, new and so some of us like institutions as i said translating are the institutions that are looking at this and and looking for the opportunities that we can bring this uh, to bear in a number of the african uh, initiatives and dialogues at least for that matter so i'm afraid it's not gone far and we need to do a lot more to to look at the tenets of, of the report and, and, and if I may make an additional comment, uh, from my point of view, well, being part of the, the task force and looking at what was the agenda of the last ministerial in Rome, uh, I thought that we were somewhat uh, a step backward because uh, uh, for me, what, what is the priority now? It's clearly to engage in a dialogue, bringing on board this multi-stakeholder, multi-policy level dimension. And I thought that at the ministerial in Rome, uh, there, there, was, there was a focus which was made on very specific topics. Uh, well, investments in agriculture, digital solutions in agriculture, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. They were, they were the, the main topics for, for the the different uh, key, key uh, events of the, of the ministerial. And I think we, uh, the opportunity was missed here to, to reconnect the dots and to have a more global perspective as a, how to engage in the so needed dialogue in terms of uh, improving the policy design process. Uh, okay, what about uh, the next one? How can we? Um, for reference, SSA breached the cleavage between North Africa and SSA, donor funding and institutional collaboration. Well, uh, uh, bridge, bridge, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it, it clearly depends on the type of, uh, of, of issue you want to, to, to address. Uh, there, are, there are similarities uh, between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, which are related to the strong process of spatial restructuring which exists. Uh, it's, I would say, possibly more important in North Africa because of uh, uh, higher densities in the population. But, uh, but now the fact that um, the connection, the linkages between the rural side and the urban side is more and more, uh, is, is clearly stronger. 
as a consequence in the way you can you can you can uh, tackle the different problems which are faced by uh, local processors or or small farmers so uh, le lessons and uh, support can exist between the two the two major regions in terms of about in terms of how to engage in a support to for instance uh, uh, in the implementation of the innovation hubs, which are clearly a, a, a reference uh, which exists both in the task force report, but also it's a strong component of the FNSSA. Uh, I think that the, 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 the way that the innovation hubs can be implemented and can be designed, it's clearly something which can be shared and, uh, and develop jointly between the two regions in Africa. For this, there, there is no difference. The difference will be in terms of identifying what are the specific problems that this innovation hubs will have to address in their specific region of our country, and also in terms of how to, how to implement the possible, uh, the, the existing innovation. But, but I think, I, I don't see here any specific gap, uh, the only, of course, difference be, being uh, the, the, the type of the, dif the different agroecology and the, the, the different uh, uh, country situation. Dr. Irene, you want to add something? Well, simply to say that, yes, there may be no differences in terms of um, um, what we are doing, but one thing we've seen that can help bridge is what we are doing in SCI, because if you look at North, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, there's quite a lot that we, we are borrowing from each other, particularly on, on technologies uh, that can uh, bring, if we have the right investments, that can bring uh, the divide um, together uh, than, than it is now. So from, from SCI and the use of or sharing of technological um, advances and practices i think if we have those investments uh, that that could help uh okay we have uh, also uh, what are the dimensions proposed to encourage uh, sustainable agriculture if adoptions in rural farmers perceptions are taken into consideration well <laughs> that's that's a question huh? because in fact it's it, 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 it's it includes all the different dimensions of, of what we have been discussing over the last uh, over the last hour, and uh, well, I, I, I think that in terms of uh, uh, sustainability, um, uh, of course, a better articulation between uh, what we referred in the report of the task force at the knowledge triangle, the fact that you have a, a better articulation between research education and the innovation system is a way to provide support to the different stakeholders, the farmers, but also the local processors uh, with regard to uh, engaging towards a more sustainable pathway, both in terms of production transformation and, and the management of natural resources. So I, I, I think that's all what is, uh, what is discussed today in terms of innovation hubs and multi stakeholders platforms, it's clearly all about uh, implementing a more sustainable way to, to develop African agriculture. Dr. Irene? The whole DNA that will help us reproduce <laughs> what needs to keep us sustainable, which is around education. Um, having a system, educational system that helps us reproduce uh, what needs to be done on an ongoing basis. That, that for me, will, will deal with the issue of sustainability. If we can even implement uh, programs for now, but we do not have the long-term plans to strengthen the, the educational system, the capacities that will re help us to reconnect, reproduce, and stay competitive, uh, over time, then um, of course it undermines the whole uh, effort of, of, of ensuring sustainability. 
Uh, okay, Dr. Bruno, uh, the last thing is, um, um, is someone is saying that um, uh, they didn't get the fourth point, which is promoting intra-African trade. Well, I think if we, if we think in terms of uh, existing opportunities for developing African agriculture and facilitating rural diversification in Africa as a strong way to uh, facilitate structural change. Uh, of course, uh, the development of Af intra-African trade is a critical driver because uh, if you consider Africa uh, as a domestic market, it means that uh, we today have uh, 1.2, uh, 1.3 billion uh, consumers in, in, in Africa. There will be 2.5 billion in 30 years from now. So we have here uh, a strong uh, driving force which can definitely facilitate the development of African agriculture, but also of African agri-food industries. Because if you have if you have a better uh, integration between the different countries and regions, of course you can uh, you can easily facilitate access to the different uh, markets. I think that the process, the ongoing process which exists, uh, which has been developing over the, the last thirty years in terms of regional integration with the regional economic communities the discussions and the, the choice which was made by the African Union to have a, a free trade uh, uh, area for, for, for the continent, it's clearly in that, that perspective that these decisions were made. And, and let me also add uh, to that, that is interesting. Of course, Africa is trying to put itself in order when it comes to trade and intra-African trade. Um, this year, as I said, the, the data that's collected to track that commitment, commitment five of uh, Malabo, which is boosting intra-African trade in agriculture, seems to be the one commitment that is on target compared to 2017, 2018, when we had about four out of the seven commitments being on target. So it sort of points uh, that even though being on, we've, we've reduced the numbers, but it is showing the effort that Africa is making, of course, with, with, with partners uh, in terms of boosting uh, intra African trade. The value, the volumes were difficult to measure, but you know, the other dimensions um, clearly shows that you know we, we are on track. Uh, okay, these were the questions, and uh, I believe we are, we finished uh, our webinar. We would like uh, to thank you, uh, Dr. Bruno and Dr. Um, Irene, um, for such an informative uh, session. Uh, looking forward to the next uh, webinars. Um, at the end, we should ident identify the problem, uh, try to make more efforts, uh, although a long way, but uh, at least we started. Uh, we should uh, work uh, globally, regionally, and continentally uh, on the processes to put them into action. Uh, we need implementation and sustainability. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we will keep you updated with the next webinars and we will disseminate about it. Um, and please uh, visit our website, which is www.leapforfnssa.eu. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And it was really a pleasure and an honor to have you with us uh, today in this um, successful and fruitful uh, webinar. Thank you, Dr. Bruno. Thank you, Dr. Irene. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.